we're going to start this morning with a panel on local issues uh, from the 2014 election, uh, a couple of issues that we think may uh, increasingly be statewide issues in the years to come. And so we're going to look at what happened in this election and whether or not those are going to be more prominent going forward. Uh, moderating this panel is Katie Merrill. Katie is a longtime Democratic political consultant. She was former chief of staff to Congresswoman Ellen Tauscher, now has her own consulting firm, uh, the Merrill Strategy Group, and is also a member of the National Advisory Council for IGS. Katie. Thank you, Ethan. Can you all hear me? Yes. Okay. Well, welcome. Good morning. Welcome to the IGS panel on local ballot fights in 2014 on fracking and soda taxes. Uh, thank you all for being here, and I do want to take a moment to thank our sponsors who are listed up there for making this event possible. So uh, the fact that we're all sitting here and having some lovely breakfast, thank you, sponsors. A couple disclaimers and caveats uh, before we begin this panel. One. In our efforts to explore the impact of local initiatives on broader public policy objectives, we are highlighting two different issues on this panel and four different specific campaigns. The campaigns to pass a soda tax in Berkeley and San Francisco, and the campaigns to ban fracking in Santa Barbara and San Benito counties. The specific campaigns are, of course, about two different issues and were run in four different localities. Therefore, they have different dynamics involved in their races. All of us up here will do our best to highlight for you the key issues and dynamics in each of the campaigns, but just given the time limits we have, we should not expect that this is going to be a comprehensive post-mortem on each of the specific campaigns discussed here today. Second, and relatedly, unlike other campaigns that are discussed at these type of post-campaign conferences, and unlike the governor's race, which will be discussed later today, Local campaigns to ban fracking and pass soda taxes will continue, which means that in essence, these campaigns are not actually over. There will be more of these local measures in California and probably around the country. Some of these specific races may be run again in the very near future, perhaps by some of the very same people that are sitting up here with me today. So um, I ask the audience to give the panelists some consideration in the fact that not all strategies and tactics can be or will be fully and openly discussed here today. And as a practitioner, if I was in their seats, I wouldn't do it either. So um, having said that, given the issues and personalities of our individual panelists, I have no doubt we will have an interesting and lively discussion. So let me take a moment to introduce um, our panelists. We have Ross Bates. Ross ran and won the anti-fracking initiative campaign Measure J in San Benito County last November. With nearly 40 years of experience in direct mail and campaign consulting, Ross has been working in and out of California legislative and local campaigns since the 70s, including orchestrating Assemblymember Richard Bloom's upset victory in 2012. Christy Wilson is the president and CEO of Wilson Public Affairs. She's been running ballot initiative and legislative advocacy campaigns for clients in California and around the country for the past 15 years. She worked with the backers of the No campaigns in San Benito and Santa Barbara in an effort to defeat anti-fracking initiatives on the ballot in those two counties. Measure P was defeated in Santa Barbara. Measure J passed in San Benito. Maureen Irwin is a partner at Irwin & Muir, a political consulting and public affairs firm in Oakland. The firm has run a number of successful local ballot initiative campaigns, including tax measures for school and infrastructure improvements. Maureen ran the Yes on E campaign in San Francisco that would have imposed a two cent an ounce tax on soda and sugary drinks. Measure E was defeated in November. Larry Tramatola is founder of Tramatola Advisors in Oakland and is a nationally recognized expert in grassroots organizing and campaigning, as well as passing local tax measures around the state. Larry ran the Yes on D campaign in Berkeley, which imposed a one cent an ounce tax on soda and sugary drinks. Measure D was the first soda tax in the country to pass. Roger Salazar, now keep it down, especially since I'm introducing Roger. Roger is the president of Alza Strategies and has been working in political communications and public affairs for over 20 years in California, Washington, D.C., and nationally. 
Roger was the spokesperson for the No on D and No on E campaigns. Perhaps you heard him once or twice on the radio last fall. So welcome panelists and thank you for being here. So I'd like to start uh, by asking each of you, by way of background for the audience, to take some time to explain your campaign. Now in later questions, we'll get to why you won or lost. So in your answers now, please focus on some exposition of your side of the specific campaign you were working on. In the case of the yes campaigns, what did the initiatives do? In the case of the no campaigns, what case were you making to voters about why the initiatives were bad? And Ross, we can just start with you and go down the panel. Well, thank you very much. Um, can you all hear okay? Good. Um, first of all, thank you very much for inviting me to this, and it's a pleasure to be here. Uh, the, I was telling somebody last night that the last time I was in Berkeley for a conference was the uh, California Young Democrats in 1970. Uh, welcome back. Welcome back. <laughs> Thing, things are a little different. Uh, for one thing, I'm wearing a suit. Um, but I, 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 got, I was only involved in the San Benito uh, anti-fracking campaign. And when I was called in, it had already qualified for the ballot. Uh, it was a, uh, a grassroots uh, operation, very, a lot of uh, anti-fracking uh, activists in San Benito County were concerned that um, the oil uh, companies there were looking uh, hungrily, if you will, at, their, uh, at some of the uh, properties there for uh, uh, drilling, fracking, et cetera. There has been some drilling in in San Benito, but as yet they hadn't had any fracking. So it was trying to prevent that. Um, it was, uh, the measure was, I think, similar to the San Bar Santa Barbara measure in that it um, banned hydraulic fracking and other forms of uh, uh, extraction and it um, applied to certain areas but not others and it didn't it left in place uh, the oil drilling the conventional oil drilling that was going on uh, it was actually a fairly complicated measure um, we'll talk more about that later uh, but that's it, it qualified with a large number of signatures had a, a lot of uh, strong local support and um, that's sort of where I came in. Is, is that what you're looking great. for? Okay, great. Uh, so I work with the producers on a statewide effort where we're tracking all local bans, ordinances, initiatives um, in the state. So 2014 was a very, very busy year. So not only were there the initiatives in San Benito and Santa Barbara counties, an initiative was qualified in Butte County, an initiative was qualified in Mendocino County. Um, there were places that the industry decided to engage in that discussion and places they decided not to engage in that discussion. And I'm sure we'll get into some um, broader discussions about drafting of these measures and uh, what was actually in them. But I think, um, you know, obviously San Benito and Santa Barbara, as uh, Ross indicated, were very similar measures. Um, not only did they uh, ban hydraulic fracturing, they uh, proposed to ban a number of other uh, more conventional and ongoing techniques that have been used in oil production in California. Um, and in fact, in neither in San Benito nor in Santa Barbara County was any hydraulic fracturing taking place. So I think you, and I'm sure we'll get into that discussion as well in terms of messaging and what the implications were for each of those counties, um, created a very different dynamic. In Santa Barbara, there's a very large industry, industry presence. It um, provides a lot of tax revenues, a lot of jobs, um, and a lot of economic uh, activity in that county. In San Benito, there's a lot less oil production there. So uh, I think that was one of the dynamics that played heavily into that debate and uh, some of the dynamics that happened both with county supervisors, local elected officials, and, and what the numbers look like for the county and how voters as a result perceived those measures. So. Great, thank you. Maureen, I know you have a PowerPoint. Do you wanna walk us through it? Great, thank you. OK, 
Okay, good morning, everybody. I'm Maureen Irwin. I'm with Irwin and Muir Public Affairs in San Francisco, and I just wanted to walk you through, I guess as quickly as I can, efficiently, what we had here in San Francisco. Uh, leading up to Proposition E, which was our soda tax, community health advocates had been working with supervisors looking at policies and ways that they could decrease soda and uh, sugary beverage consumption. <clears throat> and my firm became involved through our client supervisor, Scott Weiner, who was one of the six uh, co-sponsors, and we did it pro bono. Um, and why tax soda without getting into a lot of the details here? Um, research is indicating more and more the specific harms of soda and sugary beverages that it act, your body actually treats liquid sugar differently than it does food. A lot of that research is actually coming out of UCSF, and it's a growing body of research. So, um, and for those of you, some of you know, uh, Mexico instituted a soda tax last year, and their consumption of soda and sugary beverages has dropped about 10%, and there's been a concurrent uptick in water, juice, and other alternatives, just like people predicted. So the American Beverage Association likes to say that taxing soda is like a completely insane idea. Um, but this guy doesn't think it's insane. Uh, in 2009, uh, President Obama floated the idea as a soda tax as a potential way to help fund what was the Emerging Affordable Care Act. And in this article, he goes on, he lays out the case for it, he understands the data. Um, and in the next paragraph, he uh, goes on to basically acknowledge that uh, the soda tax will never be part of the Affordable Care Act because of lobbying, and of course he was right. Um, so we kicked off our campaign in February of last year. We knew we needed to get started really, really early to get our organizing going, and this is a photo from our kickoff. That's supervisors on the left, uh, Malia Cohen and Eric Marr. They were two of the, uh, the um, six supervisors that sponsored it, as well as Pastor Aurelius Walker and Dr. John Ma. And the basics of the tax itself, two pennies per ounce on sugar-sweetened beverages, so beverages with added sugar, uh, with more than 25 calories per 12 ounces, excludes diet, sodas, um, formulas, milks. It was really sort of targeting the worst offenders, those that have lots of added sugar, zero nutritional value, and that you see people walking around with 65 ounces of it, right? You don't see people walking around with milkshakes this big or, or juice, right? So a lot of it has to do with the marketing model for soda, which is based on overconsumption. Uh, we did really well on the endorsements. Um, the no side did get a few, um, and maybe we can talk about that later, but we had overwhelming broad support all the way from, um, on the national level, the American Heart Association, Northern California Hospital Council, locally, Mission Neighborhood Health Center, uh, the county party committee, um, clubs all over the place. We got the newspapers, the Cron, the Examiner, the Bay Guardian, um, which, when it was uh, there, and the, <laughs> sad, and the um, Bay Area Reporter. Okay, the opposition. Okay, so <laughs> how did the opposition operate? Um, well, as many of you know, they spent at least $10 million against the soda tax. I think the reports are actually gonna come out on Monday, so we'll find out how much more it was, but there were millions spent leading up to getting it on the ballot, which was never even disclosed, so I'm guessing probably around 15. Uh, mail, TV, radio, uh, billboards, constant, you name it. You know, if it didn't move, it had a no on sign on it. Um, and they also ran uh, a classic AstroTurf campaign. Everybody here knows what AstroTurfing is, right? So AstroTurfing is a tactic used basically when you're trying to make it look like everybody you know thinks this is a totally stupid idea. So you should be with the people who think this is a totally stupid idea. But it's a problem when a lot of people actually don't think it's a stupid idea. So you have to make it look like people think it's a stupid idea. Um, so. On this list, a couple things at the top, you can see who their endorsers were. That was a rather small list. They left a few people off. You know, they forgot to put on the Republican Party and the Libertarians. I'm sure it was a clerical error. Um, and in the bottom left, <laughs> in, the, in the, bo the bottom left, so early on what they started doing is tracking us. You guys know what tracking is, right? They started sending in their advocates to basically tape health advocates at public health meetings. This was at a public health meeting. They were introducing a new initiative in San Francisco. She was there. The news was there. During the news segment about the health initiative, the reporter was like, um, why is this person here with sunglasses taping um, these health advocates? They threw that in there. But um, she was around throughout the whole campaign. She eventually became, I guess, an organizer. But we were followed and tracked throughout the entire campaign. Um, 
And another thing that they did, um, this was really bizarre, they started this list of organizations that were supposedly against the soda tax. It was all these businesses. Now, I grant you, several hundred were probably against the soda tax. But first they said it was 500, and then they said it was 1,000. And we started calling the businesses, and they're like, I don't know what you're talking about. So we debunked the list. So they would post the list. We'd debunk it. They'd take it down. Um, then they'd sneak it back up over in a commercial. And then we'd, take, you know, we'd attack it. They'd take it down. It's like this cat and mouse thing. Um, but the weirdest part of the astroturfing, I have to tell you, is these rallies that they did. So they would do these rallies like on street corners where their paid canvassers would sit there with signs and chant and they'd have bullhorns. And I mean, it was like so over the top. I, I, gotta, I have to say, and honestly, I'm not sure when you spend $10 million what the marginal value of that was because realistically all it did was make them a target for media scrutiny. Um, and eventually Nightline came out and did an entire expose on the AstroTurf operation because they made it nice and visual. Um, they also had, they paid people to sit in the Board of Supervisors hearings. You'd see like a sea of red shirts. They were all paid and it was like, um, everybody knows these people are paid. Okay, but anyways, it was very weird. So here is our campaign. Um, we did a lot of grassroots outreach. We have supervisors, um, Eric Marr and David Chu did a walk uh, in Chinatown. We did a lot of precinct walking. We had hundreds and hundreds of volunteers. Unfortunately, because we were severely challenged in the fundraising department, we only had a couple organizers. And so we were really not able to harness that grassroots energy, which we had. Um, but we did the best we can could with what we had. And we did have a lot of folks. I know Robin's here. She did a lot of outreach. And so um, it was great. So towards the end, we had no, we, we knew we had, we always planned to do earned media. And in San Francisco, we knew we had an opportunity to do it because we, we have very active local press. It's a bigger city. Um, that was always going to be a part of our campaign. But towards the end, we knew it was all we had. We basically had no money. We didn't send out one piece of direct mail, no commercials, nothing um, against, you know, 10 million. So it, like earned media was it. So these pretend little rallies they did, we photo bombed you know, with, with one of those, and we used social media, that went viral, that was tweeted out to over a half a million people, um, busting their rallies, busting the AstroTurf, right? Because AstroTurf is, everybody's against this, and we're trying to say no, it's just Coke and Pepsi, and a couple other companies. Um, up there, we did a we did an art project called Limbs. We got data from the Centers for Disease Control and calculated the number of limbs amputated every day from type two diabetes, and we put them in Dolores Park, and we got press for that. Um, and I saw it translated into German somewhere, so it went somewhere. But the point was, we got it in an article, right? Soda, sugary beverages, type two diabetes, and amputations, and that's real. So that was the point. And some people say that's over the top, and I don't like, you know, street theater. Street theater can be very effective if you've got an important message and good data behind it. And so we used it to every way that we could. And this was one of, another one of their rallies. We had a, a Twitter character, Big Soda Crybaby. It was a parody account. He came to life there, and he was passing out money for votes. We had our soda, our, our, our soda bear over there, retired Coca-Cola polar bear. So we did a lot of, lot of uh, earned media. We got a lot of attention, again, to draw um, to draw attention to a really serious issue. So at one point, I can talk, Larry can talk a little bit about this. Um, I was pretty scared at one point that, you know, we weren't going to pass. What if Berkeley doesn't pass? This is like, this is really, you know, towards the end, you're just getting barraged and barraged with money. And they were really reaching for a message in Berkeley. And at the point which the no on a D campaign in Berkeley was tweeting out quotes from C.S. Lewis, um, I knew that they had really lost a message and that things were looking good in Berkeley. So... Something about tormenting people. Very odd. <clears throat> so uh, in the end, we, that was a gorilla sign that we had did. That was the no on E sign. And we had so much creative energy in San Francisco. It was great. Um, did a lot of fun stuff. Again, had we been funded, um, you know, we would have had a really opportunity to, to really um, do more. But it was a great, it was a great opportunity. Um, but... There, there is something I want to say, you know, basically, to other consultants here. I think this is important to say. I have some questions. Someday, in the not too far off future, the harm of soda and sugary beverages is going to be as obvious and it's accepted as the harm that tobacco causes. Which, by the way, when did it become okay for Democrats to start taking tobacco money? Which they are again. Um, back to soda. What I had asked these consultants from the American Beverage Association is, what are you going to say to your grandkids when they ask you why you were working against public health advocates to protect companies whose products and business practices were making so many people so sick? 
What if your grandkids knew about some of the tactics soda companies used to fight taxes and legislation? The exact same tactics that the tobacco industry used, including trying to discredit researchers and institutions who conclude their products cause harm, paying for their own studies to show that their products don't cause harm, paying dietitians like the tobacco companies did with doctors to say their products are safe and not the real problem, paying people to surveil, intimidate, and disrupt public health advocates, and setting up AstroTurf groups to create the impression that people are so outraged at the idea of a soda tax, they're taking it to the streets. So for those of you working for Big Soda or considering working for them, think about what you're going to say. And for the consultants in the, who want to maybe do some good in the world before they go, they're health advocates, parents, faith leaders, food justice advocates who want to be effective politically in this fight. They simply don't know how. Uh, they're totally outgunned. And the passion and dedication of these community members, if effectively harnessed, would be a powerful force. Thank you. An interesting and lively discussion. Larry? Well, I now know why I'm here. I'm here to keep Maureen and Roger apart. So that'll be my role, and I'll do that well. Um, you know, I'm going to be very brief in terms of the, uh, the introductory um, comments. Partly because when, anytime you're an organizer, or you perceive yourself as an organizer, you really do build your work on the work of others. And it would be remiss for me not to mention that the work that we did in Berkeley was built on the work that people had done at times, a long time before I was ever involved, or a number of people involved in the campaign. The work the city council did <clears throat> in trying to put a measure on the ballot, to craft a measure that was, that was fair, uh, that would speak to the public health issues. The work that people had done around the country trying to figure out how you, how you crack this problem, how you deal with it. Uh, the health activists and others. So our job in some ways was building upon the work that others have done, and some of those people are here today, and to you we are deeply in debt. Um, but when we started this effort, uh, we knew we were going to have some significant challenges. We were not naive in thinking that uh, if we were able to pass it, either in San Francisco or in Berkeley, it would be the first time in this country that a community had faced the power of the economic resources of Big Soda and won. So we were not naive in terms of what we were facing. Um, we also knew that we would be severely outspent. Um, no matter how much money we could raise or inspire people to give us, we would be overmatched and outspent. And that if money ever did come to us, it would probably come late, um, and that it would come when people felt that we were going to win and they wanted to be part of that, and we can talk about that later. Uh, but we had to do this with our own resources. Um, we also had to be mindful that in a when you put a coalition like this together, you have a lot of varying opinions on how to do it. And guess what? This is Berkeley. <laughs> so there's lots of folks that are strong, articulate, passionate about why you should do things in one way or another, what the message should be, this or that. And part of what we had to do from the very beginning is establish a certain amount of internal discipline. So we had one message, not 20 different messages, and we kept on it. And, and to to the credit of all the folks who may not thought our political message was the healthcare message, we all worked together to make that happen. But it came with a lot of internal uh, challenges to be able to do that. Um, we also knew that, and related to the money issue, and also related just the knowledge of Berkeley, is that we couldn't rely, first of all, if there was going to be any press attention, it was going to be focused on San Francisco and not Berkeley. Okay, we're not naive to that. Second is that there is a limit on what you can do in the mail. There's just a limit to what people are going to tolerate getting in the mail and reading about. And so what we wanted to do was to create a grassroots um, operation that was real, that had real Berkeley people, uh, not hired guns that were coming in, but real people that lived in Berkeley that can carry their message to their neighbors and answer, candidly, questions that people might have, ha might have had that are le legitimate. There's a certain number of people that, you know, I don't care whether the tax is $2 an ounce. And there's people that say, I wouldn't vote for this ever. 
So the people in the middle kind of had questions, and we wanted to be able to answer those questions in a respectful, honest way. And we felt at the end, we didn't worry how much money that, that Big Soda would put in there that we would eventually win. Now, we had no idea when we started this that we would get seven, what did we get, 76? 76% 76. 76 of the vote. We felt confident we could win. Uh, but we, and we didn't want the narrative after the fact, obviously, to be, and we all knew this, that Big Soda would be running this up the flagpole forever, that if you know Berkeley and San Francisco lost, and why would ever any other community do it? One other thing I want to say is that why local? And it's part of the discussion that we want to get into, but I want to mention this. Let's not be naive. Big Soda, and when I say Big Soda, the amalgamation of Pepsi, Coke, and all the industry there has Sacramento locked up in their back pocket. Okay, now for somebody like me who has worked for years trying to elect more minorities to office and to do that, to realize the Latino caucus is bought and sold by the, by the beverage industry disgusts me. There is nothing that's gonna happen in Sacramento and for the industry to say you have to go for statewide legislation is, is the epitome of, of hypocrisy. And if it's not money going to the legislators directly, it's going to the Latino caucus. And have to the same spokespeople for the Latino caucus in Sacramento run the campaigns against Measure D and Measure E is, I think, kind of a conflict of interest. <laughs> in all due respect. <laughs> But the, real, the, re, the reason this movement is going to go on is because there is no hope at the Sacramento level. It's going to have to be broken at the grassroots level. And it will be. This is a movement whose time, whose time has come. All the facts, all the science, all of that is on our side. The only thing that's not on our side are the overwhelming financial resources of the industry. So I was absolutely honored to work on the campaign. I was honored on a lot of different levels from the people I worked with to the fact that the community responded. Um, it will be no easier the next time around in another community. The question is, does, does it mean that there will be one after another? No, they're, they're hard and they're all individual. This, the next campaign will be harder than these. Uh, but I think we learned a lot and I don't think we learned as, lot, as much as the industry learned because we didn't have an opportunity to do focus groups every night or polling every night. We didn't have those resources to do. So they're smarter and they're better as well. Uh, so th this is going to be an interesting battle over the next uh, next uh, few years and within the next decade. But I think that, and there will be some losses, there will be some wins, and that's that's the way the world works. So I'll stop there. Great. Thanks, Larry. Roger? Yeah, uh, interesting. Okay. Um, <laughs> well, look, you know, um, uh, this is not, uh, you know, this is not, obviously, this is not something that uh, the new that originated here in San Francisco and Berkeley. These, uh, you know, these measures weren't dreamt up and thought up, uh, you know, here locally. Uh, you know, this has been an effort nationally uh, by activists to try and, and put, uh, uh, you know, a soda tax and pass a soda tax, you know, all across the country. They've been sort of cherry picking uh, locations, uh, trying to find the most liberal enclaves to try and see if they could get something passed. And it had failed up until Berkeley uh, in, in, uh, in 28 uh, to 30, I think, other uh, locations uh, around the country. Um, you know, and as, a, as, as somebody who's a, a communications consultant and, and, and political consultant, uh, you know, we, we kind of, when we look at these campaigns, and one of the things that you all want to know is, as, as IGS it studies, uh, you know, these, th these kinds of things, is we, is we deal in fact. Uh, you know, we deal in, in, in you know, how, uh, you know, how to craft a campaign that, that uh, you know, that works best with the resources that you have, uh, you know, to, uh, uh, you know to, to get the message across that you're trying to get across and to win a campaign ultimately. Um, in San Francisco, you know, the initial research that we saw, we knew what we were working with in, in, in San Francisco. Um, while people were sympathetic, uh, you know, to the concerns over diet and nutrition and, uh, and, and, you know, would like to see something done about it, they were also, uh, um, you know, tired of the high cost of doing business in, 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 uh, in San Francisco. Um, they didn't feel, uh, that at least at any of the research that we'd done up to that point, that the city needed a new tax to make the point, uh, you know, that Marine is trying to make. Uh, the voters knew that a new tax on beverages like juices, drinks, and sodas uh, would, would have driven up grocery prices and, and made it more expensive to live and work in San Francisco. They got that. Uh, what we kept hearing from people on the ground 
Uh, you know, they, again, they made it clear to us that, the, that they could decide for themselves what they could eat or drink, and they need, didn't need government punishing them with a tax uh, to, uh, uh, you know, to help them make their decision uh, for them. Um, and not only that, but again, I think San Francisco voters uh, felt that the, their elected leaders had more important issues to focus on, uh, like affordability, public safety, homelessness, is, uh, keeping the, the streets and, uh, and parks clean. So, you know, they, they again, they, they, there was a there was a question of priorities, and that's sort of what, you know that uh, that we heard from uh, you know from voters out there. So that's what we used, uh, you know, as part of our messaging throughout the course of that campaign. Um, Again, as part of our, our, our efforts to defeat uh, Proposition E, more, more, you know, uh, the, the yes side you know, focused very much on tactics, on trying to sort of pick apart tactics. They would take a list of 1,000 people that, uh, you know, that were supporters, and if uh, somebody changed their mind, you know, they'd make a big deal about it, but there were still you know, 1,000 people out there, 1,000 businesses that, that, you know, that were opposed to this tax. Uh, there were still uh, you know, hundreds and hundreds of others who, uh, you know, who, were, uh, who were in opposition. And I think ultimately, you saw with the vote total that, that, uh, you know, that when this was defeated, uh, you know that, that you know that that was the case with voters. Um, so you know, uh, despite being uh, you know a, a considered an extremely liberal city, I think voters in San Francisco shared many of the same concerns that uh, that the rest of the American public does, uh, which is in part uh, you know why Proposition uh, E failed. I, I will also note uh, that again, um, uh, this campaign in San Francisco lost in 22 of, of, of 26 neighborhoods. Uh, you know, so it was pretty overwhelming. Um, in uh, in Berkeley. Berkeley was a different animal, uh, as Lori will tell you. <laughs> Uh, we knew from the outset that that, that Berkeley was going to be was going to be a tall, tall task. Uh, um, you know, the, the the measure was a mess. It was sort of very confusing. It still is. I think um, it doesn't get implemented. Uh, and it's you know, while it passed and it's supposed to be effective January first, it doesn't really get implemented until March first because they're still trying to figure it all out. Um, best I can tell from reading the regulations that uh, a lot of it's going to be done on the honor system. So. Kudos to, to you for, for having a city that'll that'll do that. But I think you know Berkeley, um, um, we recognized from the outset was by no means representative of, of the rest of the country, uh, and I, and by no means did the, the vote did the you know did the vote pretend a trend. Um, you know, Lori uh, Capitelli, the mayor, also you know mentioned this in in, uh, in some of his comments when talking about uh, you know the win. Uh, they understood that they had you know that they were dealing with a different kind of electorate. It's a higher socioeconomic strata. That's that's those are his words. Uh, it's a different demographic makeup. Um, you know, it's a, it's a you know it's a it's a it's a unique combination. We've got 60 percent uh, you know white population, 60 percent professional management, uh, affluent, liberal, all sort of in the same place. Uh, it's got a it's got a very strong anti corporate culture. Um, you know, while at the, but at the same time having the tenth highest income inequality of any city in the in the in the, in the state, according to Bloomberg, one of your one of your big donors. Um, the, you know, so um, the so again, uh, like I said, the, the the soda tax activists had been had been uh, venue shopping um, uh, for more than five years and and uh, and had failed every time. This was the first time that they were able to win. Again, they found the, the perfect spot in Berkeley. Um, they, they're very prideful, and Berkeley is very prideful of being different from the rest of America, uh, and, uh, and they did so. Now, if politicians uh, and uh, others around the, the country want to stake their reputations uh, by doing what Berkeley did and doing it for free, like Larry uh, is, is, uh, is doing all his campaigns now, congratulations. Um, <laughs> uh, if they can get Larry to do it for, for free, then they'll, they'll go, go for it, and they do so that they're at their own risk, we believe, because, uh, uh, again, we, we think that Berkeley is the exception to the rule. Um, uh, sugar sweetened beverage taxes remain very unpopular around the country, uh, you know, and residents in other cities will vote the, vote the uh, you know, vote for the, uh, for the merits of the measure. Um, I think in Berkeley the substance wasn't as important to the voters. I think you could have told the voters in Berkeley that, that uh, they were going to take uh, all this money and uh, as long as they felt it was coming from Big Soda, you could light it on fire and they still would have voted for it. Um, so, um, you know. It, it <laughs> So the, the polling never really changed for Berkeley throughout the, 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 the course of the entire campaign. It was, uh, um, you know, and, and, uh, and then, they, you know, they got that final surge with, uh, you know, with some of the Bloomberg ads at the end. Uh, so, um, again, we, we, get, we knew from the outset that that was going to be a, 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 you know, very, very tough uh, climb, and, uh, and it, it proved to be so at the end. Thank you, Roger. Thank you, panel. Um, okay, in the case of both of these issues, fracking and the soda tax, and, and Larry touched on this. These battles have been waged uh, on numerous local ballots throughout the country. The soda tax has been proposed, I think, you said, Roger, 28 to 30 times, so around 30 times on local ballots around the nation, and failed every time until last November's win in Berkeley, and there were eight anti-fracking measures on local ballots around the country just in 2014, from Ohio to Texas to California. 
uh, and ironically, the one in Texas won, and the one, at least I, two of the three, I think, lost in Ohio, or maybe all of them did. Um, uh, and of course, there have been more anti-fracking local initiatives there in 2012 and 2013. So one of the things IGS is interested in discussing is the strategic purpose of fighting these battles on the local level. So are these efforts by the proponents to lay the groundwork for policy change at the state or national level, e.g., are they a starting place? Or are they in reaction to actions at the state or national level that the proponents didn't like? Or no action at the state or national level, despite repeated efforts by the proponents to get action? And for the opponents, is it better strategically to put these fires out at the local level? Or is it like playing whack-a-mole, which is a drain on time and financial resources? So, Roger, can we start with you and just work back this way? What's going on here? Well, again, like I said, from from uh, from our perspective, this was not this, these weren't movements that, uh, at least on the on the on the sugar sweetened beverage tax that started here in in California. That this uh, this is part of a uh, you know a national effort by national uh, activists to, to to try and uh, you know and, and uh, uh, you know and and. Uh, um, Either punish big soda, if that is, or uh, you know, or um, uh, again make it uh, you know make it as make life as uncomfortable for them as possible. These weren't measures again, like we like we talked about that uh, that started here. That uh, um, uh, you know that uh, big soda, if as, as you guys want to call it, is is uh, is you know is is uh, wanting to to willfully engage in. Uh, were brought into these these types of uh, you know of campaigns up uh, all around the country. So uh, again, I think we'll continue to see this uh, you know these 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 kinds of efforts, uh, um, and I'm sure Larry's going to do everything he. Can can to try and uh, and and uh, uh, and uh, and and uh, promote his win uh, to other cities around uh, around the state around the country um, uh, in the, and around the state. But uh, again, I, I think that uh, um, um, the demographics uh, in most other cities would make it very very tough. You know, I think I've been doing organizing work for forty five years, and I think many people know I spent the first eleven years of my career organizing with Cesar Chavez and the farm workers. And a lot of the lessons we learned there are applied today. And what were some of those lessons? Number one, farm workers couldn't achieve anything through the, through the legislature in Sacramento, which was controlled by the agribusiness, which was controlled by moneyed interests. And so what did we have to do? We had to go to local communities. We had to go to local communities to tell our story, to be able to build support, and eventually build enough support in local communities that eventually people at the state level couldn't ignore us. We would be totally naive to think that we could ever get legislation, and I don't care what the health benefits would be, what the, what the, what the research shows about the impact of sugary drinks, we will never get it passed in the state of California unless there is more movement around the state uh, in, in local communities. That's a reality. Uh, this is not some sort of conspiracy of healthcare activists trying to find a weak spot in the, in, the big, in the belly of big soda. It's people who are really concerned about the health of children trying to come together to find some, some solutions to this. Uh, is this the last or the, the only thing that's going to happen? Obviously not, but it's, it's something that's so important that's got to be done. No one is naive uh, in un trying to understand that the soda industry is making unbelievable profits, and they're making profits that are having an impact in children's lives uh, and not good. Um, I want to say something about San Francisco. Um, you would think San Francisco lost. They got 54%. I know there's 56%, sorry. There are many elected officials who are serving in Sacramento today that would be thrilled to get 56% of the vote. The other, but the one thing we need to keep in mind are these are tax issues and not health issues. These are not health issues in some ways once it comes on the ballot, and Roger is right in that way. And I think they found, a, they found an avenue and they, they tried to exploit it. Um, but when it, if we look at school construction in the state of California now, it's not the state solved the school construction issue. It's because local communities, one by one by one, passed local bond measures to fix their local schools. It's the same thing that's going to happen here. If we look to somebody else to solve the problem, it'll never be solved. So I think this is a healthy thing. I think it's going to happen. As I say, there will be there will be losses, and when there's a loss, the industry will say, "Oh, it was just Berkeley that won." When there's when there's a victory, they'll try to minimize that victory. Oh, that was just Los Angeles. 
Los Angeles doesn't mean much, you know, uh, or it's, it's whatever. And let's not be naive. I am going to make Roger Salazar, or we are going to make Roger Salazar a very rich person in the course of this. <laughs> The silver, the silver Start shopping lining. for a yacht. So, uh, so I just want to agree with what Larry said. And as you saw in that slide I did early on with Obama, he, you know, he agrees that it's a good idea, but he goes on to acknowledge at the federal level how difficult it is. And of course, at the state level, it is too. Uh, so many... Uh, so much social change has started at the local level. You know, you look at gay marriage in San Francisco. What year was it? Gavin Newsom, um, right, started it. And now how many states? I can't even count, right? And so as people see an idea, policies enacted, oh, this works, this is okay, right? And I think as the body of research keeps growing and keeps getting out there, there's going to be more and more support. Everybody here knows that smoking is bad for you, but that's been obvious for how long? The research on soda and sugary beverages is newer, but it's solid and it's growing and it's just going to keep going. And I think um, the more it gets out there and the more understood how harmful it is, the more people are going to be willing to tax it. So, Christy and, and Ross, on the on the fracking side of this, can you talk a little bit about what you think the dynamic is of these local initiatives around the country? And, and Christy, we'll start with you. You're on the no side. But, so what do you think the fractivists, as they're called, um, are, uh, are trying to, try, thank you, Sacramento Bee, um, are trying to achieve? Well, um, I know it's really easy to say that oil owns Sacramento or owns the federal government. It's making billions of dollars. It's making a lot fewer billions of dollars uh, now than it ever was <laughs> with oil prices as low as they are. It's a question, you know, we're shutting down production in California, we're shutting down production in the U.S. Um, I think there's a bigger national question that is going to be, um, is being had right now on energy independence. OPEC would love nothing more than to drive all production out of the U.S. and make us more reliant on foreign oil. And I think it's a question of, you know, we, we are going to face that question. Um, in terms of California, I think that the fractivists have been highly successful in California. Um, I don't know if it's buyer's remorse. I don't know what the issue is, but in you know they obviously have a big champion in Fran Pavley um, in passage of SB4, which put some of the strictest, uh, probably the strictest regulations on hydraulic fracturing um, in the country on oil production in California. The final regulations on SB4 were just released in January of this year. They came along with um, a scientific study on hydraulic fracturing. It requires a statewide EIR, I think, to you know suggest that um, Senator Pavley was rolling over to oil interests is, you know, baffling, um, if not laughable, that she, I mean, she's never been that kind of a legislator in California's history. I think, um, so I think that's, uh, you know, part of the statewide dynamic going on there. Uh, I think there's some challenges for the, that community at the state level, at the federal level. Uh, the Secretary of the Interior, Secretary Jewell, has come out multiple times and said these local fracking and production bans are not the way to go. Um, and even the uh, author of the report on seismicity, this claim that uh, fracking causes earthquakes, has recently come out and said, you know, the proponents of these bans are overusing and overstating the impacts of hydraulic fracturing on seismicity. Um, and so I think that there are going to be some challenges. And that's part of the reason that there are challenges, both at the state level and the federal level, is that there are a lot of regulations. There are, you know, the science isn't quite there to make these extreme claims. I think additionally, um, in places like Santa Barbara, I mean, you're seeing in Kern County, they have just declared a fiscal emergency because the price of oil has dropped and their county gets so many uh, local revenues that fund schools, they fund firefighters, they fund police and sheriffs, they fund local services, they fund their parks. They are seeing a 40% price uh, drop in oil really impacts that local community. And I think that's what voters in Santa Barbara saw. And, you know, it's finding that place where you can produce um, oil in a you know, strong, with strong environmental protections, provide energy, keep our economies going, um, and not be dependent on foreign oil, where they have fewer, if any, environmental regulations on producing oil. For the foreseeable future, you know, we're going to need 
oil to run our economy. And I think that's, you know, it is part of a broader debate, but um, the, the oil price and OPEC flooding the market, I think, is going to bring that debate to the forefront sooner rather than later. And, and Ross, before you um, answer the, the question about sort of the, the dynamics here, I, I do want to say I was um, interested to read in USA Today, uh, just as a point of fact, that California is the fourth largest oil-rich state in the country behind Texas, North Dakota, and Alaska, and the third highest oil producer in terms of states in the country. So it's an interesting point of fact and, and probably not one that, that a lot of people know. So um, you want to talk a little bit about the dynamics of the local initiatives? Sure. Uh, I think that the big difference, um, I mean, I, I, again, first of all, I want to e echo what Larry said about our campaign, and I, this is relevant because um, there are, in, in San Benito, uh, one has to give credit to um, all the people who came before and all the activists on the ground because um, they made a, a tremendous, played a tremendous role uh, in this uh, fight. Um, we'll get it later into the tremendous role I played, but that's the here or there. Um, <laughs> but, but seriously, no, there, there was a tremendous amount of um, both, both nationally on this issue and locally. And I think the difference um, is with the soda taxes, soda is the same everywhere in the country. You know, there's no difference in San Benito, Santa Barbara, wherever, in what you get when you have a two liter can of Pepsi, or a two liter bottle of Pepsi. Um, but in fracking, it depends significantly on the local experience that people have had with fracking, whether it's in Santa Barbara, where it's been, uh, where there's a, a larger industry, uh, oil industry there, or whether it's in San Benito, where they had a very recent, very bad experience with um, not a major producer of oil, but a local oil producer who um, continually lied to the, uh, the Board of Supervisors and to the city about what they were going to do and what they were going to, uh, what penalties they were going to pay for doing it. Um, so, and, and again, Denton, Texas has a different uh, you know, dynamic than uh, than Ohio, so it's a it's going to be a national issue. Um, I think that there are uh, activists in um, uh, California and elsewhere who are very dissatisfied with SB four. Um, I don't think it's because they believe. I mean, if they do believe that Jerry Brown, who's a big um, uh, enemy of the frack of the fractivists. Um, I don't think they would believe that he's in the pocket of big oil. Some might, but um, well, okay. <laughs> My point is made. Um, but uh, but I think that um, that level of dissatisfaction has um, sparked um, the movement and also that you know there are enough incidences of um, you know fire coming out of faucets and you know what I think you would describe as scare tactics, um, as as I think we would describe uh, those on the uh, other side would describe the stuff about job losses and other things as uh, as scare tactics. I mean that's frankly what we do as professionals is amp things up um, and, um, and take, but um, given all that, I think we can't help but see uh, more and more measures, and I think they will be local measures because the local experiences are different. Um, I don't think that uh, places without oil wells are going to respond in a, are, I do believe the places without oil wells are, are not going to be as interested in, in, in the whole issue of fracking as people um, who, whose water is threatened or whose jobs are threatened, depending on who you're listening to. Um, and um, so it'll, it's going to almost have to be lo local. Great. 
Thank you. Um, I have three more questions I want to ask the panel before we turn it over to the audience, and I'm mindful of time, so maybe we could treat this as a kind of lightning round. Um, kind of. Um, so could you each just say in one or two, give us one or two examples or reasons that you won or lost your particular campaigns? And Ross, can we start with you? Sure. I think that... Um, <clears throat> You know, one of the things that I was able to do is when I was brought in to help the grassroots operation was to um, insist on doing polling. And what our polling showed, done by Ritter Braden of Denver, give credit, um, and um, what our polling showed is that voters just didn't like fracking. And that's where we started, and that's where we finished. Um, you know, our, our polling numbers in August, uh, September or August, uh, reflected the final totals. So um, the voters, uh, you know, we started out with an advantage that, um, that we couldn't, uh, that, we, that it wasn't able to be shaken. And the other reason was that even though we were wildly outspent, we were outspent probably 15 or 16 to one, um, San Benito is a small enough community that, I mean, we only had 14,000 voters. So even with limited resources, we could send seven pieces of mail. Even with limited resources, uh, limited monetary resources, we had tremendous human resources and with only 14,000 households to reach, or 14,000 voters, we could have troops, again, like Larry said, legitimate residents of San Benito uh, who could go out and meet these people. So by the, because we had fewer voters to deal with, we were able to make our resources sufficient. They weren't gonna match the other side, but they were gonna be sufficient to get our message out. Christy, can you talk about why you think you won in Santa Barbara? Sure. I think Santa Barbara, um, in San Benito, there were a lot of advantages in terms of the county supervisors, their willingness to, you know, over, overlook what we would call flaws in drafting. Um, one of the issues, but in Santa Barbara, they weren't quite as willing to overlook those things. They had a lot of production there. They're very aware of the risks to their county. So the county supervisors had a number of meetings um, discussing the risks to the county. The, uh, the general counsel, um, county counsel said, indicated in a meeting that this was the biggest liability, uh, fiscal liability that the county had ever faced. Um, and they had no uh, insurance that would cover those costs. Those would be borne exclusively by the county. Um, and again, because it went far beyond, both of the measures um, went far beyond just banning hydraulic fracturing, that really started to make the county look at what those impacts and what that measure actually did and what the impacts were to the community. And that's why so many members of the community came out in opposition to that measure. It was voted down 61% in Santa Barbara County. I mean, that's not a small number in a county that is heavily democratic and heavily likes to uh, call itself, no offense to Berkeley, but one of the birthplaces of the environmental movement. So for them to vote that down at 61%, it had to have much broader implications than to ban a, a practice that wasn't occurring in the county. So I think their messaging was very tight and they were very organized. I would say that, you know, in uh, San Benito County, the yes campaign was much more organized and than the yes side in Santa Barbara. I think that made a very big difference. But I do think that, the, uh, the, as you said, each of these counties look at, and each of these uh, municipalities look at these issues differently, depending on if they have production in there, it really does have an impact on that community, so. All right, thank you. Maureen? So I would say our biggest problems were money, money, and money. Um, Right now in the healthcare environment, there are people that are in organizations that are willing to give money to research and outreach, but they don't want to give to political fights. There's something unseemly about getting involved in politics. I've heard words like blunt instrument. Soda taxes are a blunt instrument. It's like, no, I don't think so. Um, but the reality is that if consumption is gonna drop as, as significantly as it is going to with taxes and regulation, 
you're in a political world. People are going to have to be willing to engage in political fights and get over whatever, you know, ickiness there is about being in politics. So, um, and that's going to be an ongoing problem that hopefully we'll figure out. But we need more than just one or two individuals or foundations who are willing to fund these, frankly. Larry? Yeah, I'd, I'd like to say that you really only learn when you lose. And so when you lose, you start tearing everything apart and say, why did this happen? What could we have done differently? Uh, how could we have been better? When you win, everything is rosy. Uh, and everything that you, everything you did worked, right? Which isn't true. But it, it, there's this afterglow of, of when, you're, when you're successful, you think everything worked. But if I boil down the Berkeley win to a couple of things, I would say number one, it was the willingness of all the people at whatever level, whether they be a city council member, whether they be a health activist or a grassroots parent or others, is the willingness to work together in building a grassroots army. Uh, so losing a little bit of their ego, losing a little bit of their own, maybe their own individual messaging, but work together was number one. Uh, and the second is we stayed on message. Uh, we were not, uh, we had no benefit of polling, really. Um, we had to rely on what we felt was the right message, but we stayed on it. And um, I think those two things allowed us uh, a common message um, and uh, this, this really growing grassroots army where people really wanted to be a part of. And that maybe a third thing is we had a lot of fun. Uh, campaigns are serious sometimes. They can be, they can be stressful. Uh, you can carry the weight on your shoulders. And when you're dealing with issues where there's major opposition on one side or another, they can kind of be, they can become too serious. And we tried to take our work seriously, but not ourselves seriously, and tried to have fun. So make it, we made it an uh, uh, environment that people wanted to work in and they wanted to be able to participate. And so those, for us, I think were the, 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 the key issues. Um, I think for San Francisco and... Um, and Berkeley, I think there's, thank you very much, Larry. Very helpful of you. Um, I, think, I think for both Berkeley and San Francisco, um, we, there, we won in, in, in San Francisco and lost in Berkeley very much for, for very similar reasons. You know, affluent voters uh, uh, voted for this measure. Uh, everybody else voted against it. And there were more affluent voters in Berkeley than there were uh, in, uh, in, in San Francisco. I think uh, uh, you know, working voters, uh, um, uh, saw that this would have a disproportionate economic impact on them, that would have an impact on them, uh, you know, uh, uh, you know, and, and taking money out of their pockets. And, and again, this wasn't the, and even if they were sympathetic to, uh, um, uh, to issues of, of, of diet and nutrition, uh, you know, we're, we're not gonna, gonna vote for it. I also think that, that it helped them in Berkeley uh, on their side to have a, a pretty bland measure that had a lot of loopholes and exemptions uh, to make it so, so basically so uh, toothless that, uh, um, you know, that it really wasn't gonna have any impact on anybody that so I think that was another factor for them um, <laughs> as long as we're in the discussion here and and I've heard my my colleague here saying we deal with facts when we're in the soda industry or we deal with facts there is no fact that less affluent people in Berkeley voted against this that is an absolutely misstatement and a lie and we need to deal with that because you know, at some point in time, we are just not up here as, you know, paid political hacks. We have to kind of believe in what we do. Larry, you had, you had Lori Capitelli tell people that we aimed our target at, at the higher income, socio higher socioeconomic strata because they were the ones that vote. So he's, he's saying that, he's, that you guys are targeting higher economic voters uh, because they're the ones who vote, and then you're saying that the, 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 other, the other piece isn't true. Look at the facts. Precinct by precinct. We won every single precinct in Berkeley. And we didn't win it. We dominated it. And if you look at the precincts in the, what we call the flatlands of Berkeley, we won those dramatically. So you can't make a statement that poor people or less affluent people didn't vote for it. That's part of... That is not truthful. Now we can be, we can debate whether the measure was a good measure or a bad measure. We can debate whether there were loopholes in it or not. But we can't debate the fact that low-income minority voters did not support this. That is a lie, and we need to say it's a lie. And that is a great segue to my next question. 
because what I wanted to ask each of the panelists was, is what's the biggest myth out there in the public narrative about why you won or lost? So this is the public narrative, not necessarily your opponent's narrative, but sort of as the press has written about it, what's the biggest myth out there about why you won or lost? And, and Ross, you wanna start? Sure. Um, I think that, uh, I'm gonna make a more general statement uh, here about, uh, I think the myth that, um, that, we've, that we sort of uh, went against is that uh, big money is determinative. Uh, it's important, of course, but the campaign in Berkeley, the campaign in San Benito, showed that if you have the right circumstances, if you have the right message, big message can beat big money. Uh, and I think that's the, uh, the myth that's out there just generally is that the side with the most money always wins. The side with the big money often wins, but there's enough circumstances where um, the side with um, the big money uh, doesn't win. Um, the other myth in a contrary mode is that you can win by attacking big money um, just because it's big money. Um, I think that, you know, again, as Larry said, there was in a campaign with a significant grassroots element, uh, a lot of internal discussion, a lot of internal uh, dispute. And one of it was how much to attack big money. And because we had polling that indicated that that wasn't as effective a, as a result, we were able to, as much as you can apply message discipline in a grassroots uh, campaign, we were able to do that. So I think those are more general myths uh, rather than specific myths about the campaign, but those were the two that struck me as the most um, mythical. That's great. Christy? say the biggest myth, and I'm, I know that I appreciate that the press has to shortcut their descriptions of measures and what they do, but uh, that these are fracking bans, that these are strictly hydraulic fracturing bans. Almost all of these uh, ordinances and initiatives are drafted well beyond hydraulic fracturing to use of steam, to use of water, um, to ban uh, production at a much greater level. In fact, on Friday or Thursday, I guess, uh, I was listening to LA Public Radio and they had someone on from Food and Water Watch who said, it's not that we just don't want fracking, we don't want drilling, period. And so I think to, I mean, you're saying that on public radio, I'm not you know, revealing any secrets here, but that to imply that these are just straight hydraulic fracturing bans, is a disservice to voters because they go far beyond that. And uh, I think that, again, raises the broader discussion about whether we produce um, our energy here domestically or we import it in from foreign countries. And maybe there's, I think, everyone looks to this great future where we don't use oil, but the reality is right now that's, that's not practical. And in the meantime, what are we gonna look like? What is, it gonna, what is our uh, energy consumption going to look like? Maureen? Um, I think the greatest myths on our campaign were basically the messages of the opposition. Um, the idea that somehow jobs were going to go away if the soda tax passed, that this was regressive, um, just all the stuff that they threw out there, all of which had a little bit of traction, um, none of which were, I think, particularly um, really, really effective. Um, there was also a myth at one point that Bloomberg had given us money, and I think the opposition had said that to a press person at one point, which was not the case. We were never given Bloomberg money, but I do have to say, overall, I thought the press did a really good job in covering um, the proposition. There were a lot of articles that went really in depth, and almost all of them, they pretty much got all the details right on something that was fairly complicated, so that was good to see. Larry? I, I think the, the biggest myth, and it's a continuing myth, myth is that Berkeley is Berkeley, and it doesn't mean anything to anybody, any place out of Berkeley. And let me remind people, although I don't need to remind most people in this room, that, that there was a time when Berkeley was the first city that, that opposed apartheid. Uh, and that became a, a state movement and a national movement and an international movement. Uh, it was the first city that, that promoted disability rights. Um, 
and now it's something that we, you go to a curb and if there's not cutouts, you wonder what happened or why not. Berkeley has always been a leader, and I think that's one of the things that makes us unique. Now, does, Berkeley, does that mean that when we pass this in Oakland or we pass it in San Francisco, we pass it in other places around the state, and eventually this becomes that they won't have their unique stories to tell. But to try to isolate Berkeley as somehow being the land of the super rich and the poor, and uh, super poor, or the land of freaks and the crazy, is, is, is part of the myth that the opposition tries to have. And I think that we learned a lot of things in Berkeley, but the main thing we learned in Berkeley is that uh, by working together, we can make change, and that's a lesson that's gonna come, uh, that we're, we're gonna extend to communities uh, throughout the state and throughout the country. I think the biggest myth is that I'm somehow getting rich off of all this stuff, but, uh, <laughs> but I appreciate that. Um, no, I will say that one of the things that, that I was looking at uh, um, in, in what I've seen in the coverage of the of, of uh, uh, you know of both of these campaigns uh, post-election, I think one of the myths that's out there right now that uh, um, uh, that I think is 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 just that is that. Uh, um, uh, San Francisco, uh, if, if San Francisco just does a majority uh, tax, um, that, that, that it'll somehow uh, win. I, and again, I think San Francisco voters are not going to give um, politicians a, a blank check uh, to, do, uh, you know, to, to, uh, to, to do with as they please. Um, I think uh, you, you would see those numbers drop even further uh, in San Francisco if, uh, if, uh, if, if they thought it was just going into a general fund like it was in Berkeley. Thank you. Um, I'm going to save my third question and uh, in interest of time here and uh, turn it over to audience questions do uh, and well, apparently we don't have any yes. so um so do we have our mics available robin torello right there my question is to miss wilson um you said you won by 61 percent, but what was the voter turnout because the voter turnout was very, very low, and a lot, and mostly in the state it was actually, yeah, and I and mean, mostly and, Republican. Yeah. So I was just curious. Uh, actually, if you look both at San Benito and Santa Barbara, they had higher than average turnout. Um, it's one of these issues. Uh, we talked a little bit about turnout yesterday on a uh, panel, but I do think a lot of local issues as well as statewide issues often drive turnout, and that's what I've seen over nearly 20 years in this business is people come out more often on issues than they do on candidates, and they turned out, I think it was um, mid-50s in both of those uh, locations. So it wasn't, you didn't have... Um, much to what people might assume, it actually drove, it, I think it was a voter turnout and, and I would driver. And I would totally agree with that. It was 57% in both counties. So it, yeah, it, it was a real driver. Hi, Maureen. Um, I was wondering if you think that, besides all the money, that that some of the issues with the campaign in San Francisco had to do with some sort of schisms within the actually people who were pushing this. I know that there was some debate at City Hall about the initial drafting of it, and it strikes me as similar to some of the stuff we've seen on some other kind of liberal issues, um, marijuana, for example, where, where a lot of people have different ideas, and that might impact whether there's a lot of cohesion. Sure. Um, well, in San Francisco, the soda tax sort of came about from two different avenues. There were um, some advocates who had been working primarily with Supervisors Marr and Cohen on legislation, and at the same time, Supervisor Wiener had been looking more at the research side from UCSF. So at one point, they were both starting to talk about soda taxes, um, and in the end, they merged their legislation. Everybody was on the same page. So initially, there was two sort of different approaches. But um, you know, as the campaign got together, everybody was on board on the same page. Hi, uh, Bob Stern. Um, we wrote a book, Democracy by Initiative, in which we said if big money spends money against a measure, no on a measure, it almost always wins. We have some exceptions here. Do you think it's because it's a local measure, small turnout? Is it Berkeley? And will you see that more at local levels where big money spending on no side still will lose the election? Uh, yes. Uh, I, mean, the I think the answer to your question is, is yes. Um, that big money is less impactful in a local election and the smaller 
the local, uh, in general, of course, the smaller the local um, uh, community is, the less powerful big money can be. Because, again, you don't need as much money to get your message out. And there is a recognition of, at least this was the case in San Benito, we had a lot of neighbor-to-neighbor -neighbor support. We had a very strong uh, endorsement group from all areas of the community, and we were able to touch that group and use that group uh, to make our point and to counter some of the, the opposition points. So I would think that, yes, it, the more power, the, the bigger the money, the smaller the community, the less the impact of big money. Hi, I'm Brad Hertz with the Sutton Law Firm. Uh, in postmortems, we often focus on the campaigns themselves, and I'm curious how important are the official election materials in your view, like the ballot question itself, the ballot arguments, and the impartial analysis? Uh, and I read in San Benito, there was a lobbying effort to change the ballot question, which originally didn't refer to fracking, and then the Board of Supervisors agreed to change the question. So how important are those more formal election materials? Um, I think they're very important, without question. And, you know, we do tons of, of local tax measures around the state, and I think you have to be... You be, want to be very thoughtful about your 75-word summary, so not only is it it's legal, but it's clear. Uh, the arguments in favor. I mean, what do people read? You have to look at that. Well, the first thing they read is the ballot statement itself when they vote, so that's probably important. Then they may look at the argument, so that's important. And then they may, after that, look at the, look at the impartial uh, analysis. Political mail and all of that is probably fourth or fifth on the lines of what, what's important. So that it, you really do need to take care, and it's got to obviously, um, in our situation in Berkeley where they challenged it, uh, they knew how important it was. So I think there's, there really has to be care in thinking about it. So it's, it's obviously done legally, but also clear that people can understand it. And, and, and I, I want to say that in California, it used to be that, that some of the local ballot majors, you couldn't even understand them. Uh, and there has been a movement to try to simplify the language and make it clear so people actually know what they're voting on. So I think it's really important. Yeah, I just, I want to agree with that. And I think San Francisco is the only county, I think, that has ballot simplification where there's a panel and their job is to actually take the legislation and write a summary and bring it down to eighth grade level. And it's really, really valuable and it's helpful and important. More and more people are reading the ballot pamphlets. Um, I've talked to pollsters and asked them, you know, do they ask people, you know, do you read the ballot book? And they say, yeah, but a lot of people are probably like, you know, lying. <laughs> but, so it's not really clear how many people are really reading them. I think in San Francisco, it's a lot. Um, more and more I talk to people, they say, you know, I take all my political mail, I dump it in the trash, and then I read the official summary. So in San Francisco, you actually go before ballot simplification, this committee, you make your case as to why you think certain language should be in there or not. And it's extremely, extremely important. And it was interesting on the day where we had ballot simplification, the opposition didn't even show up. I was shocked. Um, so well, at any rate. Uh, and, I, and I'll just sort of add to that. It was very interesting in San Francisco because uh, um, you have to uh, enter into a lottery to be the opposition, uh, uh, to have the official opposition ballot statement. And uh, uh, so we lost the lottery. We weren't even uh, the Libertarian Party was the opposition uh, statement for uh, uh, for no on uh, on on, D, on E. And uh, um, you know we had to, to you know so ours was just part of a number of other uh, opposition statements that were out there. So that was a very interesting sort of dynamic that uh, that we saw there is that uh, you're even though we were the official no campaign, we couldn't. Be the official no statement. But, but you guys didn't even show up for ballot simplification. You, that just doesn't happen in San Francisco. You, you just don't ditch ballot simplification. So I'm still not sure why or what went on there. But when I go to ballot simplification, I wear my lucky shirt. I say a prayer on the way to the elevator <laughs> over to the room. And I look around, and the opposition wasn't even there. And like I said, if you know San Francisco politics, the idea of not coming to ballot simplification is like insane. Ross, do you want to talk about the San Benito? Um, well, uh, first of all, I, I hi Brad. Uh, first of all, I, I was not involved in the campaign until the ballot was, language was already written. So I'm, I'm uh, I do believe. First of all, I want to defend briefly defend uh, direct mail, but that's 
another, another part of the uh, discussion. Um, because I do think it has an impact. But, and I do think people read the ballot statements. And I think it's very, I, I was involved in writing the ballot statement, uh, the positive ballot statement, and the argument against the negative ballot statement. And I think those are important in terms of, it's your first chance uh, to set your argument. And, um, you know, if you're not communicating from July on, and again, if you have limited resources, it is a good way to make your, it's sort of your opening statement before you either go out, well, not either, both, go out in the field and also uh, produce your paid communications. Question? Yeah. My question is to Maureen. It was brought up that maybe there'll be a 50% uh, ballot measure in the future, but why did San Francisco decide to go for the two thirds instead of Berkeley and its wisdom? Well, I guess it wasn't wisdom because they, they could have gotten three quarters, but, uh, yeah. <laughs> but why, why the, uh, the two thirds in, in uh, That's a really good question, right? That's one of the questions people most frequently ask. And the advocates um, in coming up with a policy and deciding which way they wanted to go did take a look at doing a general tax, including some polling data and other information. And without going into a lot of detail with the other side here, they decided to go for um, a two-thirds tax, which we did poll on as well. And we, you know, we knew it was going to be a challenge, but um, it was interesting. Our, our polling numbers looked good. Um, and we knew we'd have good support. And I think also to assume that the campaigns would have been exactly the same you know, like if we had just done a general, the campaign would have been exactly the same and everything would have played out the same. I don't think it's wrong. I think, I mean, I think it's wrong. I think a lot of things would have been different. So it's not like you could have just transplanted one campaign over onto the other one. I just want to comment on that a little bit. You know, having done tax elections, you know, you can run a perfect tax election. Perfect. I mean, you have the right message, you have the right issues, you have a great, and you may get 75% of the vote. Perfect measure. What does that say? It means 25% of the people voted against this perfect measure. Okay, So now you're looking at a campaign where you know your opposition has unlimited resources. And they just have to go to 20, from 25 to 33 or 34, nine points. Because they can almost get 25 points without doing anything, and pretty much that's what they got in Berkeley 20, with their money. But so you give them unlimited resources, you get 9% of the vote, and it, it's a different campaign. One of the things that happened to Berkeley, and it's a, it comes back to the question of big money, in some ways, they ran a better campaign for us than we ran for us. When you're starting to blanket the, every BART station with their obscene literature and their obscene science, with every billboard in the city of Berkeley, <laughs> Every, in the city of Berkeley being covered, every newspaper ad being covered, they did our campaign for us. It was, it was you know, it was overwhelming and tiring for the, peop for the people in Berkeley. So, so I think that you can turn money around on the local e level, and that's why in some ways they don't want to battle at the local level, or say you can't win at the local level, or try to make an example. And I think sometimes when I look at, at what they did in Berkeley, I think it was a message to the rest of, uh, of the state saying, okay, we will put in any amount of money against you. So before you ever think of putting this on the ballot, knowing what the odds are, and I think it's, a, it's, a, it's, it's an intimidation tactic to other communities. So um, as I say, this, is, this will be a long fight, and there are going to be successes, and there's going to be failures. And, uh, but I think at the end of the day, 10 years from now, 15 years from now, we'll be sitting here, or somebody will be sitting here, it may not be me, but there will be people sitting here, and they will talk about how California was one of the first states that did this in a broad way, and the health of children is improving because we, we did something around these, these terrible things that are being sold in all of our stores around us. Back there, the woman with the glasses. Yes, yes ma'am. Don't you think that as it becomes patently clear that big soda is as much of a destroyer of health and a killer as big tobacco has been, 
that at that point, when all of these young juvenile diabetics start becoming blind people and amputees, that we'll finally have a national movement. I'll let Roger answer that question. <laughs> Thanks, <laughs> I, again, that, those are some very uh, um, uh, you know, aggressive characterizations, and I just don't think that the, that the rest of America feels the same way you do. I just don't. Okay, next question. Yeah. Uh, the, right there, yes, waving your hand, yes, you, yes. And microphone. Rich Kinney, Vice Mayor San Pablo. I just wanted to, uh, to say that my little town of San Pablo is among one of the highest uh, rates of childhood obesity in uh, the Bay Area. And one of the things our council chose to do was to put a, a, uh, a healthy element on our city uh, work plan. And in so doing, we established a, a, uh, an anti, a, a, ch a childhood obesity task force and we invited all of the different agencies uh, to come and join us in discussions to figure out how to avert that problem. And, uh, and it's been quite successful. We were able to actually get Coke and Pepsi to join us. And we told them if you'll join us and be part of the solution, we won't put a sales tax initiative on the ballot. And they, they graciously joined us. They put a lot of money in the process of educating uh, our schools, helping, helping bring education, helping bring change to our, our mom and pop stores and what we put out front for, for the people when they go to the store. They see the, the vegetables, they see the healthier drinks, and there's all kinds of incentives we're trying to use as a city to try to, uh, to change the mindset and the practices of the people uh, and, and getting everybody involved in the process seems to have been more beneficial. And I'd like to just to hear your comments to that uh, option. That sounds very productive. <laughs> and, and on that note. I think, it's, I think it sounds very manipulative. I think it sounds as though they're trying to stop this in other places. And they, they are... Um, isn't that the goal, though, to, to try, and, uh, to try and, and, and work together to try and make people healthier? Sure it is. Okay. So sure it is. That's a good approach. And, and on that note, I would like to thank our panelists and our audience. Thank you.